It was born in 1935 as the revolutionary Douglas DC-3 airliner. To the American forces in World War II, it was the C-47 Goonie Bird. The British called it the Dakota. But whatever name you give it, this faithful workhorse helped fly the Allies to victory. From the Burmese jungle to the North African desert, it carried the load and delivered the goods. It hauled vital supplies, towed gliders, dropped paratroops and evacuated casualties. After the war, it helped the modern airline industry to take off. Even today, hundreds still fly throughout the world. Well, outside of the Model T Ford, I think the C-47 was one of the great inventions of the millennium. Many times I would pat the side of the airplane and I climbed in and I said, you're a good and faithful servant. And I meant it. Using archive film and color reconstruction, Battle Stations tells the story of the most important aircraft design in the history of aviation. And of its finest hour, the night parachute drop that launched the liberation of Europe. You're busy praying, and I mean praying. And uh, when they hit the ground, I can tell you they're ready to fight. The story of the DC-3 begins in the early 1930s. Aircraft then were mostly built of wood and canvas. Air travel was an expensive luxury. It was also noisy, bumpy, cramped and dangerous. Some designers believed that the future of air travel lay with giant aircraft like this fantastic flying wing. Or the even larger Dornier flying boat. Most preferred to play safe and stick to traditional medium-sized machines, usually powered by three engines. But things were about to change. In 1931, the all-metal Boeing 247 revolutionized passenger aeroplane design. With only 10 seats, it was more like a flying limousine than an airliner, but everybody wanted to fly in it, and Boeing soon had a long list of would-be customers. TWA were not prepared to wait in line. They asked Boeing's rival, Donald Douglas, to design them something bigger and, if possible, better. It was an historic decision. Their letter of August the 2nd, 1932, represents a landmark in the history of flight. Douglas later called it the birth certificate of the modern airliner. In record time, the Douglas engineers produced a design which not only outperformed the Boeing, but had a far more spacious cabin as well. The prototype was named the Douglas Commercial, or DC-1. It entered service as the DC-2 and was soon outselling its rival. But the real breakthrough came in 1935 with a completely redesigned and enlarged version for American Airlines, the DC-3, or Douglas Sleeper Transport. It was the last word in luxury travel, with 14 sleeping berths for its pampered passengers and a hostess to tuck them in. American Airlines soon realized that it could earn more money by operating the DC-3 as a 21-seat day plane, flying non-stop New York to Chicago in less than four hours, the train took 18. The modern airliner was born. By 1939, 90% of all the world's airline passengers were being flown in DC-3s. By 1940, Europe was locked in a war which threatened to engulf America as well. The US Army saw that a rugged transport aircraft could be useful. 
In December 1941, it suddenly became essential. When Japan attacked the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, the United States was plunged into World War II. DC-3s were quickly commandeered by the government for use as military transports. The gleaming and luxurious airliners, the pride of America's passenger fleets, were stripped of their interior fittings. All signs of their previous ownership were obliterated with a coat of olive drab paint, and they were press-ganged into the service of Uncle Sam. But it was soon obvious that hundreds, if not thousands more, would be needed. President Roosevelt asked the American aircraft builders for an all-out effort to mass-produce huge fleets of fighters, bombers, and transports. I should like to see this nation geared up to the ability to turn out at least 50,000 planes a year. Donald Douglas confidently responded to the challenge. We can do it. I know that the American aircraft manufacturers functioning under a free democratic system in the American way and unhampered by politics and partisanship can and will help the President and the Congress to meet the challenge to everything that this nation holds dear. Now he would have to deliver the goods. This is Detroit, Michigan, in case you don't know. They call it the automobile center of the world. I've worked here all my life. If America was to win the war, its huge industrial capacity would have to be harnessed. The mass production techniques of the motor industry perfected by Henry Ford would now produce trucks, tanks, ships, planes, and their engines. Pretty soon it's going to look like this. And then like this. And lots more coming. The Douglas Company was given a contract to mass produce a military version of the DC-3 to be called the C-47 Transport. It had no passenger seats and was fitted with a strengthened floor to handle heavy loads with wide double doors at the rear. The Douglas Transport was the ideal machine for mass production. With a big enough labor force, it was simple and quick to build. Hundreds of lightweight aluminum sheets were folded and drilled, overlapped and secured by 500,000 rivets to form the structure. The fuselage was little more than a metal tube, pointed at the tail and rounded at the nose. Inside the wings, partitions of sheet metal formed a series of compartments. There were no conventional wing spars, yet they were incredibly strong. If damaged, they could be changed with nothing more than a few basic hand tools and the patience needed to undo the 328 securing bolts. The two air-cooled engines were reliable and easy to service. From three giant factories in California and Oklahoma, Douglas began to turn out these flying trucks at an astonishing rate. By mid-1944, finished aircraft were rolling off the production lines at the rate of one every 34 minutes. They were built by an army of workers, many of them women getting their first taste of factory life. Rosie the Riveter became an American icon. Like G.I. Joe, she was helping her Uncle Sam to win the war. Rosie the Riveter was a name given to all the women that were working in aircraft plants forever. When we were maintaining the aircraft, we often wondered, I wonder what Rosie's name actually was that worked on this airplane. And Rosie the Riveter kept with us all through the war. Like the Model T Ford, which put America on wheels, the C-47 gave the GI his wings. That was our airplane. 
And all I can tell you is that it was never a better workhorse. Very plain, very plain. But it turned out to be a, a terrific instrument of war. An instrument that was destined to play the lead in some of the most crucial and the most dangerous missions of World War II. Paratroops, airborne forces, and freight, they're all part of the job for the Dakota. Developed from the famous American peacetime airliner, the Douglas DC-3, She's now in extensive use with the British and American forces. It was agreed that the C-47 should become the standard transport aircraft for the Allies. Soon its outline became familiar in every theater of the war. It's hard to overstate the importance of the transport aircraft in the Second World War. It towed gliders, it flew in bullets and bayonets and blankets. It reached out to remote airstrips, sometimes where there was no road. It enabled armies to be effectively supported in the field, probably for the first time in history. All of this accomplished by an undramatic flying truck. To the British, it was the Dakota. To the Americans, it was the C-47 Goonie Bird. But it had plenty of unofficial names as well. I named my aircraft Y, W-H-Y question mark. Why do we have to wake up at four o'clock in the morning? Why do we have to haul gasoline? Why do we have to fly through all types of weather? But you just carry out the mission. It was just a flying truck. Anything that had to be hauled to get to where it was destined to go in a hurry, the C-47 did it. It's a good and well-designed airplane. And structurally, it is very, very strong. The flexibility of the wings is such that it creates very little stress when you're flying with a heavy load. And it gives you the maneuverability and the feeling of safety. The unarmed C-47 transport became the most versatile aircraft of the war, with a growing reputation for reliability on the battlefield. It was the ship that would get you home. As it mastered each new task, the missions became more demanding and more dangerous. Its side door made it the ideal aircraft for parachute drops. It dropped stores and equipment, providing a lifeline for isolated forces, like the British troops fighting deep in the jungles of Burma. And it dropped men, the elite paratroop units that played a key role in the Allied invasions from North Africa to Normandy. When America entered the war, two airborne divisions were formed, the 82nd, known as the All-American, and the 101st, or Screaming Eagles. When combined with the C-47 transports of the 9th Troop Carrier Command, they quickly established a reputation as an elite force. Well, the first time that I ever saw a paratrooper with his parachute wings and his polished boots, uh, I just knew that that was for me. I always wanted to be an army officer. I always wanted to lead men in combat. And I knew right away I wanted to go to jump school. I'm Jewish and I had a vendetta to fight. Oh man. Uh, I, I would say at least 50%, uh, 60%, the men are weeded out. You must be in extremely good physical condition. You go through seven days and all it is is physical running and drill and push-ups and exercise, rope climbing, and uh, a lot of the people can't do it. They're, they're out on day one and they just don't want to do it because they don't have the mental aggressiveness that I want to be a paratrooper.
the C-47 became an indispensable part of the airborne operation. The paratroopers adopted it enthusiastically. The former airliner was proving to be as tough as they were. It was exciting. It's a very exciting thing to be with men to jump at airplanes. You're dealing with men that like to fly. They like to fly at night, low altitude, and jump out of airplanes with 150 pounds, with everybody shooting at them in a strange land. And uh, when they hit the ground, I can tell you they're ready to fight. And if they have to, they fight each other. And those men that have that mental attitude that I want to be a paratrooper, and I am going to be a paratrooper, then those are the men that make uh, their five jumps and they get their wings. And a great day. I know it was for me. And then, once you're on the ground, there's such exhilaration that you made the jump and you shoot open. And I think that may be why the paratroopers uh, do so well in combat, even though the enemy is all around us. It's such an exhilaration that <laughs> we can do about anything. There's a special something about airborne units, that almost tangible esprit de corps that helps define elite organizations. It comes from a number of things. In part, it's because of the need for physical fitness and mental toughness. In part, it's because of the need for airborne initiative, that need to really move fast and think fast once you get on the ground. And in part, too, it's because being a parachutist means that everybody in the unit, regardless of rank, shares a common experience. So these folk are very tightly bonded, members of a really effective team. Toughened, skilled, easy under discipline, our men knew they were ready. I had my vendetta to fight. I went with them because I wanted to get in the middle of it, because to me, if I could get back there, I had people who were in concentration camps, people who died, etc., etc., and I was very angry. I was an angry kid. So what Uncle Sam did for me was he trains me, he gives me the, the weapons, he gives me the transportation to go over there and fight my own vendetta. In the late spring of 1944, the build-up began for the D-Day invasion of Hitler's Europe. The exact date and location of the invasion were top secret information given to only a few people. Among them was C-47 pilot Adam Parsons. He would be one of the first to fly into Normandy. I was put in a compound so that I couldn't speak to anyone because of the knowledge that I had of where the drop zones were. I never knew there were that many boats, landing craft, ships, barges, trucks, and jeeps anywhere in the world, but they seemed to all be drawn as a magnet right to southern England. The prospect was both terrifying and exhilarating. The C-47s and their crews were about to play a leading role in one of the most dramatic events of the 20th century. They were about to make history. Being young and gung-ho, you know, I wanted part of the action. We knew that nothing like this had ever happened. I was glad that I was part of it. If I had to be somewhere, I was glad I was there. They took us to a sealed airport where nobody was allowed in and none of us allowed out. We knew there was something cooking now, something big. Invasion markings painted on every ship and glider brought the whole thing even closer to us. We'd soon be on our way. The objective of the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions was to protect the right flank of the invasion and prevent German forces from reaching Utah Beach. Flying in from the west, the paratroops would jump on drop zones located around the small town of saint mer Eglise, south of Cherbourg. 17,000 paratroops were to be dropped at night ahead of the seaborne invasion force. It was to be the largest airborne operation ever undertaken. 
Once on the ground, the paratroops had to be entirely self-sufficient. Each man was festooned with a mountain of special equipment. It was a formidable list. One jumpsuit, boots, gloves, May West, main parachute, reserve parachute, rifle, 45 automatic pistol, trench knife, jump knife, hunting knife, machete. One cartridge belt, two bandoliers, two cans of machine gun ammunition, one Hawkins mine capable of blowing off the track of a tank, four blocks of TNT, one entrenching tool, three first aid kits, two morphine needles, one gas mask, a canteen of water, three days supply of K rations, two days supply of D rations, six fragmentation grenades, one gammon grenade, one orange and one red smoke grenade, one blanket, one raincoat, one change of socks and underwear, two cartons of cigarettes, one helmet. Total weight, 120 to 130 pounds. When we jumped in combat, what we had on us was our only things that we owned in the entire world. That was our gear. And now we had a job to do. Now we were really ready. General Ike nearly tore his pants stepping over the barbed wire, but he didn't care. He wanted to talk to us. Ike had a lot of questions to ask. What's your name, soldier, he says. Where's your hometown? Eisenhower's decision to spend the final moments before the invasion with the paratroops reflected the importance of their mission. He knew that they had the toughest assignment of all, to be first into action. His advisors were predicting casualty rates as high as 80%. He inspected a few of the boys who really have to be tough, the pathfinders. They go in ahead of all of us and plant signal markers so we can find a way. They live on a steady diet of danger. They took three men out of each company and uh, we were trained as pathfinders and we would do the jumping together. We'd go in ahead of everybody. When we, when we arrived, like at St. Eric Lee's, there was nobody there. A few of the outfits got the idea they ought to show the Germans we had Indians in America. Here they are. Indians from the Loop, from Back Bay, and the Bronx. On June the 5th, 1944, as the long summer evening began to fade, the paratroops prepared to board their C-47 transports. Each man knew only too well how dangerous their mission was. They would be jumping at night into heavily defended enemy territory. Their chief weapon was surprise, but if they failed to regroup quickly enough, they could easily be overpowered by the German forces. We had a pictures taken in front of the C-47 uh, in fact, I had my helmet uh, in my hand like so, that, like they did in the 1875s when they were taking a picture. And uh, we were all happy. I uh, did not envy them to go into battle with all the equipment that they had to carry. If a paratrooper weighed 170 pounds, he had another 120 or 30 pounds of equipment on him. I mean, it was so bad, it tied up with this stuff, that to get on your, on your C-47 with the little steps, I went up on my knees. I couldn't, I couldn't raise my leg enough to, to get up to the first step. And most of the guys went up on their knees. I went back and shook hands with everyone on board. And I was wondering, what are they going to meet when they land? At least we were coming back home. We knew our job, we were good at it, we were well trained. We knew the pilots of the C-47, very good pilots. We knew we'd get, get to where we were going.
heard the roar of engines as the Pathfinder ships began hopping off. We knew we'd be following soon after. The invasion was on. As darkness fell on June the 5th, 1944, the main force of the airborne infantry took off to launch the D-Day invasion of Europe. Talk about making trains run on time. You could have really set your watch by the split second way those guys took us off. After all, they were gonna have to fly it again and again, all night and the next day, only under fire. And that's no fun when you figure that these C-47s haven't any armor, no guns, and have to fly low over the dropping zones, straight as on a bombing run. Flying there, I felt very, very uneasy that something might happen that would foul everything up. The D-Day airborne assault was incredibly dangerous. Paratroops and glider troops had to be dropped behind Hitler's Atlantic Wall into a French landscape laced with rivers and floods and marshes, towns and villages. They had to get there through anti-aircraft fire and of course there were Germans already on the ground. The weather was patchy, there was a lot of cloud actually over the objective and of course all this was being done at night. I think a lot of us realized that this was going to be by far the toughest combat mission we ever had. And we knew the Germans were waiting for us. We had all kind of photos of how the drop zones were laced with barbed wire, machine gun positions, minefields, and you name it. So I, I think we were, we were apprehensive that a lot of us weren't going you know, weren't, weren't to get back. I think that anybody who tells you they were not scared is a liar, a big liar. And if he's really not scared, he has no heart. He wants to die. It's just something that a combat soldier has, and it's in there. You don't want to talk about it to your friend to say, look, I'm scared, I'm, I'm really frightened. I, I wonder if I'm going out the door. As they reached the Channel coast and the friendly lights of England slipped away into the darkness, each man struggled to cope with his own emotions. I, I read a book. I get my mind off it. I read a book, with, a book of funny jokes got to get your mind off. And I was actually able to read it and comprehend it, in spite of the fact that I was scared stiff. I carried a little harmonica in my jump pocket up here where you kept a knife. I had a, a 10 note harmonica. And the guys around me, we just blew our heads off playing that harmonica and singing. There was a lot of nervous energy, a lot of it. As they approached the French coast, the Pathfinders prepared for the jump into enemy territory. They were about to launch the biggest combined operation in history. The accuracy of the entire airborne drop would depend on their marker beacons being placed in exactly the right locations. Now, the German anti-aircraft batteries were in range. It sounded like, you know, all kind of drums were beating around. And the pilots that flew in, taking all the flak, holding the course at low altitude, to give us a chance to get down. They're, they're really heroes. I was standing in the door all the way from the coast all the way into San Maragliese. The Murderie River was our last signal that we were getting close to the drop zone. Normally, on all pair drops, we're about 700 feet. And as you gave an alert that we were approaching the drop zone. We had a series of lights, and uh, the red light was a warning light that they were approaching the drop zone, and the green light was the exit. When the green light came on, they all jumped. Stand up!
So we knew exactly what we were doing and stand up, hook up, and then check equipment. And I uh, would check the equipment of the man in front of me and check my own equipment. Okay. Sneak ready, jump master. Stand in the door. And the idea was to get out of that plane. We were like, what's it called, an airborne shuffle. You, were, you, were, you had your knee and the next guy's behind, and you were shuffling out so that when you landed, you were close together. It was the responsibility of the crew of the C-47 to make certain that the paratroopers were dropped as close to target as possible. And even a delay of three or four seconds in turning on the green light would have thrown them off their designated target zone. half a second apart, really good, fast out of there. Out we went. And the war's on. Bob Murphy and his pathfinders had a good drop, right on target. But as the main force approached the drop zone, things began to go seriously wrong. The German anti-aircraft batteries started to open up. Then the C-47s hit a bank of thick cloud. The tight formations were forced to spread out to avoid collisions. Many of the less experienced pilots overreacted and climbed too high. Others speeded up. Some just hit the green light and turned for home. The paratroops from these aircraft were scattered over a wide area. Some landed in flooded marshes miles from their drop zone. Weighed down by their equipment, they struggled to get free of their chutes. Many failed and drowned without ever firing a shot. I was dropped, I would guess, of somewhere in the neighborhood of about nine kilometers east, northeast, of the drop zone. When I went out of the door, everything I had attached to my harness just broke loose, including my father's World War I 45 caliber pistol. And I landed unconscious. And the minute I hit the ground, I hear thump, thump. It sounded like at least a platoon of crowds at jackboots. You know? And here I am, completely helpless. We had a you know, three buckles to get the shoot off. My gun is, is, is folded in half. So there was this tiny little ditch over here. I go in the ditch and I pull the shoot over my head. I must have hit the ground pretty hard, didn't break any bones. And I came to and heard these French voices. And then I realized I'd lost all my kit. My father's revolver, all the ammunition in my pockets had gone right through the cloth. You know, and so I'm not too, I'm not too well equipped. And all of a sudden, there's an outline of a guy coming in from the other side. And I didn't want to give my position away. So instead of yelling, I said, halt, who's there? And he said, I'm a yank, I'm a yank, don't shoot. Now they had to regroup and face a well-equipped and determined enemy. For those who survived, it would be the longest night of their lives. As June the 6th dawned, an extraordinary sight greeted the people of saint mary Glise. The hated Germans had gone, and the town was full of Americans. Many of the scattered paratroopers were still hopelessly lost, but enough of them had reached their objectives, and the town was secure. But the 3rd Battalion had a pretty good jump. They got saint mary Glise. And the 1st Battalion was scattered, but they were able to get down the Lafayette Bridge. And uh, they stopped the Germans just in time. Four men stopped two tanks, plus disabled a third one with bazookas, which was awe-inspiring. We could see them coming at us. 
but we never let them by. They never got across that bridge, which is exactly what they wanted to do, to come into St. Mary Glees. Go through St. Mary Glees with their tanks and all their infantry and down to Utah Beach. They never get over that bridge, not a one. D-Day, which was the greatest amphibious assault in history, was a triumphant success. And by evening, the Allies were firmly ashore in Fortress Europe. But a great deal of this success had depended on the work done by the airborne divisions. They'd helped prevent German reinforcements from getting through to attack the troops on the beaches. All those acts of individual heroism, all those bitter skirmishes in the hedgerows, they'd all added up to victory. But victory at a cost. These are American dead on the beachhead awaiting burial. Medical officers search for identification tags. There's all sort of talk about you fight for freedom, you fight for the flag. It really comes down to fighting with your buddies to stay alive. I think that's true uh, when you say mama and apple pie. That's long forgotten. Your closest friend uh, is your comrade who's in the slit trench of the foxhole next to you taking the same shells and mortars and 88 uh, artillery that you're getting and under the same fear, you're in that hole praying or sweating and he's doing the same thing. And when you come out of it and you're together, you, you have a bond that's like children and brothers and sisters and it remains forever. And when they're killed on the battlefield, there's just no way to express how deep that loss is. For every man was killed, you got three seriously wounded and evacuated. Rough airstrips were hastily improvised, and once again, the rugged C-47 earned its battle honors. The same aircraft that delivered the paratroops and towed the gliders into Normandy now became flying ambulances. Many a wounded soldier owed his life to the C-47 crews and the medics who carried him back to the safety of an English hospital. It was a non-stop two-way shuttle. Fresh troops and supplies coming in, casualties going out. As the invading troops pressed inland from the beachheads, they were kept supplied by airdrops. Wherever a large enough field could be found, the C-47s would land to deliver the precious fuel supplies that kept the tanks rolling as the big breakout began. Yeah, our command lost 27 airplanes hauled in gasoline, but we hauled several million gallons, so I guess when you balance it out, it was well worth the effort. With the narrow roads heavily congested, gliders were often used to deliver troops and supplies quickly to the battlefront. The C-47 could tug one or even two gliders. Can you imagine? They run down the runway, one glider takes off, the other glider takes off, and finally the airplane takes off. That's quite an airplane. It seemed as if for the C-47 pilots, no mission was impossible. They could actually pick up gliders and evacuate the wounded without landing. Casualties were loaded into the glider and a tow rope was attached. Its looped end was suspended between two poles. A low-flying C-47 trailing a long hook would then catch the loop and simply snatch the glider off the ground. It was a risky but highly effective technique. As the Allied forces steadily closed in on Germany, the C-47s remained in the thick of the action. Most of their missions were flown at low altitude, and the cost in human life was high. And at that altitude, every type of imaginable gunfire was thrown up at us. And uh, we had nothing to defend ourselves with, just our flag jackets. And we sat on them because all the fire was coming up from underneath. We went into Germany hauling two gliders. The fellow on my right 
got shot down. And then on my left, that aircraft was shot. The right engine was burning, and he just went forward, but pulled in his gliders, but crashed, killing all the crew. So I was hemmed in between them, and I did not have one hole in my airplane. So you sometimes wonder who's looking down on, on us. On May the 7th, 1945, the war in Europe finally ended, and it was time to celebrate. In August, Japan surrendered, and peace returned at last. Most warplanes became redundant overnight, but for the C-47, a new life was just beginning. A post-war boom in air transport was about to take off. With thousands of trained pilots leaving the armed forces and thousands of war surplus C-47s coming onto the market at bargain prices, a host of small independent airlines began to spring up. They were a far cry from the pre-war luxury of the DC-3 fleets, but they helped to launch a new revolution, worldwide low-cost air travel. And they never stopped. Even today, hundreds of wartime C-47s are still in service, still flying safely and economically, which is why their owners prefer not to trade them in. People will buy a car, and they love that new car smell. I have yet to get in a C-47 that didn't have the smell, which is a little different from any other airplane. And I think that once you start the engines and the gasoline starts flowing through, there's that nostalgic feeling that you get. You immediately know if it's a C-47 by the sound of the engines. It takes you right back and it just makes you fall in love with it all over again. The story of this machine spans more than two-thirds of the entire history of powered flight. The livery may change, but the Goonie Bird flies on. Before his death in 1981, Donald Douglas summed up its place in history. I do not believe that any of us who worked on the design and development quite realized we were building an airplane that would outlast the careers of all of us. Perhaps she will fly on forever. I hope she does. Well, the first uh, time that I ever saw a paratrooper was with uh, Francis Maloney, who was a next door neighbor and my older brother's uh, very close friend. And he came home uh, in August of 1942 with his parachute wings and his uh, parachute, blue and white parachute on his hat and the polished boots. And I just knew that that was for me. And he told me about the athletics and going through the various stages of parachute school, and I knew that I could do it, and uh, uh, that's what I wanted to be as a paratrooper. Incidentally, Francis was killed in action in Sicily. And, uh, but he told me all about the elite unit and the camaraderie, and I was a 17-year-old boy, young man, I let's say, uh, and uh, which I, with my father's help and a little, uh, Ink eradicate affords my birth certificate from 1925 down to 1924. In October 1, 19, 
42, I was in the United States Army and, uh, in fact, at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and from then on uh, in the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment from Africa on. And uh, I enjoyed it very much as a, as a young man. Uh, I still enjoy it uh, as like an officer and director of being with my comrades. The greatest friends I've ever had in my entire life are my comrades, still to this day. You must be in extreme, uh, extremely good physical condition because uh, with the training, the first week of, uh, they call it uh, stage A, the A class, or the stage number one, the first stage of it in a week, you go through seven days and all it is is physical running and drill and push-ups and exercise, rope climbing, and uh, a lot of the people can't do it and they're, they're out on day one and they just don't want to do it because they don't have the, uh, the mental aggressiveness that I want to be a paratrooper. And those men that have that mental attitude that I want to be a paratrooper and I am going to be a paratrooper, then those are the men that have that attitude that make uh, their five jumps and they get their wings and a great day. I know it was for me. I can remember it uh, very well. I was 17 years old and I made my fifth jump. And I was, I was so proud of myself. Well, and the only time we packed a parachute was uh, in the first stages of the first five jumps. And the first jump that you make, you pack your own parachute. And then if you wish, you can go back and pack. But we never packed any parachutes once we were overseas. That was done all by riggers. Nobody ever packed any parachutes. It was all done for us. And they just hand you a parachute and a reserve parachute. Well, uh, you are very meticulous and careful on the first jump. And uh, many of us would call over uh, one of the sergeants to, uh, do I tuck this under or over? And uh, they would kid with you, well, what do you think? And uh, uh, then they'd say, well, maybe, let's see what you do. All right, that's all right. And then they would walk away and say, but I wouldn't jump that shoe. <laughs> you go back and unturn it. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, we, we never packed any shoots when we were overseas. Yes, uh, uh, there's, that's one of the big fears in the airplane when you're sitting in the C-47 that you think about, I think mostly is, is not ACK ACK or small arms fire or the tracers that are coming up at you, it's, is my chute going to open? And uh, that is the big fear I think that a paratrooper has. Then when a chute does open and he's on the ground, he's so exhilarated that, uh, like I say, he can almost walk on water and, and is released from his heavy parachute and his reserve chute and uh, in, in great mental condition, even though you're in, in the dark and probably lost. <laughs> now you're firing, such as uh, down at Lafayette Bridge, where we had a lot of enemy that we could actually see. We had tanks coming at us, and uh, uh, my comrades like Leonard, uh, Lenol Peterson, John D. Bolus, and Marcus Heim, who was here, a distinguished service cross for knocking these tanks out. We could see them coming at us, but we never let them by. They never got across that bridge, which is exactly what they wanted to do, to come into St. Mary Glees, go through St. Mary Glees with their tanks and all their infantry and down to Utah Beach. They never get over that bridge, not a one. We, st we stopped them, and uh, that's the name of my book, No Better Place to Die. And those words came from Lieutenant uh, John Dolan, who was called Red Dog because he had brilliant red hair, he was the first lieutenant only, who took over from Captain Sayre, who was wounded uh, in A Company down in Italy. But uh, when the message came across from Sergeant Billy Owen, should we move back and get out of here? Uh, he said, well, there's no better place to die. And that message was brought back from John Red Dog Dolan to Sergeant Billy Owens, uh, who was about 37 years old, 
at that time in Normandy. And uh, we stayed there. We were not going to get out. We were not going to retreat. And uh, we stayed there and we stopped them. And they never got across that bridge. Never. Not one German. The average GI, if I may use that world-renowned term, which we liked, hadn't the slightest idea uh, of where he was going next, uh, what was going to happen to him, other than that he just wanted to stay alive and, and defeat the enemy. I mean, to, to shoot the guy if he had a different color suit. And uh, I might say that the, the Germans uh, had probably the best artillery piece in the world, the 88 artillery. And uh, uh, that was the best. It was the worst for us because uh, it, it, it was like a rifle. Then they would shoot an 88 at an individual soldier running across the field. Uh, so it was devastating. And probably one of the most feared weapons uh, that a combat soldier could go through, whether he was regular infantry coming in on the beaches or uh, regardless of where he was. Every combat infantryman knew the 88. And I'm sure the fellows that may be watching this television uh, have fond memories and can hear that round coming in. <laughs> the casualty rate, a soldier really uh, didn't comprehend until actually a combat was over because your very close friend, like uh, my very my closest friend Leslie D. Fries, who's buried in in England now, uh, he never came back from Normandy. He was apparently captured and then retaken up in Cherbourg, and he's he's uh, uh, buried in England. But uh, when I got back out of the hospital after 56 days and got back to my unit, I asked, "Where is Leslie D. Fries?" He says, "He he never came back. Went out on patrol." And it's it's really the first time that he was my closest friend that I, I felt that what death was to a friend. But death is something that uh, a combat soldier doesn't think about uh, on a daily basis. Even though you just saw your friend killed in action or blown to pieces, uh, uh, you don't think about it at that moment. And it comes later, after you're out of combat, that you can feel this loss. And you sometimes think about it if you're like back in porn or, and uh, uh, sitting in your tent and maybe uh, just looking up at the ceiling and, and these things go through your mind. And you can see the friendlier face. I can to this very day see my closest friend, Leslie D. Fries, in his face. Uh, but he's buried at Mattingly Cemetery. And I go to see him. Every time I go to England or Normandy, I, I stop off to see Leslie. Time, 2200 hours, June 5th, 1944. The place, England. C-47s in their new invasion battle paint stand waiting. pictures, the first Air Force films to be received in the United States, arrived 48 hours after the amphibious assault began.
Orders are read and reread. A message from General Eisenhower. En route to the target area, the bombers pass the Isle of Guernsey, west of the Cherbourg Peninsula, and dive to Strafe Lighthouse on the German-held island. A British typhoon lays a smokescreen to shield the ships from German shore positions. This B-26 drops a stick of 16 250-pound instantaneous general purpose bombs on enemy beachhead installations at 624 hours, exactly on schedule. Meanwhile, other units of the 9th Air Force, operating northeast of the La Havre area, dropped 2,000-pound bombs on heavy enemy coastal guns on the French coast between St. Valery and Fécamp as dawn breaks on D-Day. <laughs> 